in France, French people will occasionally tell me that my surname Eads uh, reminds them of fighter jets and ask me if I work in fighter jets. And uh, no, it's just just a name. Um, when I read your name, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, when I was looking at the schedule and, and, uh, and met you, I, I was thinking you might be a Python programmer from your surname. Yeah. Uh, this is Dr. Frederick Pai. He comes from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Institute. Um, he is actually a C++ hacker, so I think we'll have to have a beer. Uh, he's going to talk to us about um, sort of decision support and autonomous systems. Uh, he has a robot that uh, scans the coast, and that's all I know about his talk. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to start. OK, thank you. So first uh, and foremost, I'm not from the machine learning community, so I am the over exception. I'm actually more from the automatic pla uh, automatic planning and plan execution for uh, robots. Uh, the big thing is, so ocean domain is something which uh, where there is a lot of sensor data coming through. Uh, my planner needs samples, and the scientists don't really care about the sensor data, but what they do represent. So there is really a strong need about that. Uh, uh, about really do this mapping between the concept and the thing. So what I'm going to present you here is more a bunch of problems, few things we did uh, quickly with machine learning and very basic machine learning uh, uh, in situ for the robot in order to be able to sample data and also further down the road what we're working now in this kind of uh, more having a, a network of assets, uh, both static and uh, moving asset, and trying to really sample the ocean in a very targeted manner, and which can be interesting problem for your community, and which we are interested in. So first off, so what is Embari? So it's not a real research institute. We are a close neighbor from, uh, from Berkeley, it's uh, the Monterey Bay, Actually, here is uh, just uh, 70 miles south of San Francisco. And uh, Embari is right there. Uh, it's uh, the building over there. So we are right by the sea. And uh, an interesting aspect for us, for ocean science, is uh, there is this huge canyon in the bottom of Monterey Bay, which means that when people are deploying, uh, they sail them only uh, an hour or two by boat before uh, being at uh, deep water. And also the Monterey Bay is probably the, the part of the world uh, in the ocean where there are the most assets sampling at any single time, because there is not only this institute, there is a bunch of over with a static and dynamic asset, which are really something uh, at, uh, all year long and collecting data. So, this, uh, this institute is founded by David and Lucille Packard Foundation. So, and it's kind of a mix between ocean science and engineering. It's a really, there is this thing where both are right, uh, working on in hand to provide new technologies for science and also uh, science is giving feedback on what are their needs and what kind of uh, they foresee as interesting problem for the future. Uh, so yeah, we have a bunch of assets, so there are two boats right now, and the Zephyr is going to be replaced. Two uh, autonomous and a water vehicle, which have an autonomy of 18 hours, which is covering 80 kilometers in the bay overnight. Uh, and one long-range AUV, which can uh, navigate uh, for something which is uh, around a week or so right now. And well, all of them are equipped with a bunch of sensors about the uh, physical and chemical property of the ocean scientists can analyze. And uh, this is mostly what we're going to speak about. Uh, so, yeah, ocean science nowadays, so it's uh, going at sea with a scientist on a boat and doing the sampling manually with uh, all the interns, etc., cost a lot of money. So. 
more and more you're seeing either static or mobile assets which are deployed at a, in an area of interest because they can sample a lot of data autonomously, uh, bring it back, and then the scientists can just focus on analyzing the, the data. They are still going out, of course, uh, because some data cannot really be provided in a, in a manner as good as uh, when they are there physically, but it's, it's really this community, because of budget issue and because uh, of trying to stay as long as possible to sample the ocean, are using a lot of these assets, which are collecting data and, and really uh, uh, trying to give them a better view on how the ocean uh, is working and what are the relations between biology, physics, and chemistry uh, in this context. Uh, so there are many assets which have been developed. So boys are just a fixed boy with a, a bunch of sensors sensor which are doing vertical profile. And usually they are uh, sending back the data uh, in a constant stream or less. Uh, Drifter uh, are uh, small uh, floats you're dropping in the water and which are following current and allow you to stay with the water mass without using and then there are also gliders and AUVs, which are more this kind of mobile asset, which are uh, with a better level of control on where to go. And of course, there is satellite data, which uh, they are using a lot to see the big picture on what's going on. Uh, so, but we have this asset, but at the same time, until now, at least, uh, these assets were usually constrained on their ab ability to adapt and react. Uh, mostly because dealing with uh, the dynamic of the ocean and the problematic of re-extract meaning on board of the asset uh, in order to readapt based on the scientific need was uh, very challenging. And uh, so they did separate the thing and for example, the AUVs, when I came at Emory six years ago, there was a pre-designed set of waypoints. It was surveying this area and just building time series uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then they were just doing slight adaptation based on their understanding in this long time series. Uh, and the ocean feature of interest for scientists are really, as I said, uh, uh, they are often express through complex relation between all the data we have. So, uh, and I will show some example, but it's uh, really, you have this thing, and quite often on top of that, the scientist has not, doesn't have the perfect mapping about that, a mathematical mapping. It's more uh, an overall high-level understanding. And uh, if in order to do explicitly this mapping as a software engineer, it's usually a lot of back and forth with the scientists if you're doing it in a classical manner. Uh, and the target, the feature you are targeting are always moving. And in two very different ways. So first of all, it's physically, water is moving, it's following current. So when you see something, if you're coming back at the same place, it's probably not there anymore. Uh, and when you see something from satellite data, which is four hours old, uh, it's in some aspect, if it is something very small, it may be at a totally different place when you deploy the vehicle. Uh, and there is also scientific value because as they, their understanding inc uh, improve, but also as the hot topic in uh, the ocean science is evolving, they will have different uh, targets. It's one year it will be, uh, we want to focus on front. The year, year after is we want to uh, focus on bloom batches and how they evolve. So it's, you have these two aspects, which are very challenging for engineering, because if you design an algorithm and the year after, it's not relevant anymore. Uh, it will be problematic. And uh, not only that, but actually nowadays you'll see more and more as they did gather uh, in the past this time series, they uh, start to have 
a better understanding on what's going on and where to focus. Uh, so, which means that these vehicles are less and less meant to build these static long-term time series, but more and more trying to follow a specific feature of interest. Uh, so yeah, in the past it was a repeated waypoint based surveys with a waypoint being defined by their latitude and longitude. Uh, and they were limiting to just a sensor which were giving just physical and chemical properties. Um, the focus is now really moving to things where uh, understanding how this physics and chemistry impact biology. Uh, understand also trying to track the lifetime of bio biologic population in a certain water mass. Uh, so, for example, what provoke a, a, a red time to bloom or to disappear? Uh, what is the evolution of different population in this uh, bloom patch? Uh, and also, the scale of the interest really narrowed down. It's, uh, they are speaking more and more of mesoscale, which is order of few kilometers in the ocean, and try to focus on a water mass at this scale and follow it through for example. But uh, then there is a problem, it's how do you define a water mass? So to see you, so the water of the asset we are using, and, uh, and part of this evolution too, which is uh, to better understand this thing, is so here is a Dorado Dumper AUV. So, so it's something which is around eight feet long. Uh, and uh, so it has a, a delta, and it's flying at roughly 1.5 meter per second. And with a bunch of uh, sensors, there is something like 10 different sensors, yeah. okay. and uh, which are sampling uh, multiple data uh, all on their own. Uh, and uh, on top of that, what was added five years or six years ago are these uh, syringe, which are called the gulpers. And the objective is our 10 of them in the vehicle is when something you know, of interest happens, is collect the water, and it takes roughly, it's relatively fast, it takes three seconds to collect the water, so it can be brought back to the scientist and they can do further analysis, such as genetic analysis and things like that. Um, uh, the big question that came five or six years ago is, how to trigger these things in a targeted manner. And this is, so uh, this is roughly when I was hired and I roughly explored this thing. But there are also where people worked on different algorithms. One approach, which is just looking, so there is a sensor which is giving the chlorophyll fluorescence of the water. So it's looking at the chlorophyll fluorescence uh, of uh, the measurement, and then it exposes the fact that the data, when it's sampling, so you have a view of uh, an accurate view of the sampling of the data, is going up and down in a yo yo manner. And basically, when it detects uh, the peak chlorophyll peak on the first yo yo, it will plan for the next, uh, for this area to sample the thing. And uh, there are techniques on the dark, the black circle represents where it was sampled inside, and they are also using two white samples which are uh, sampled outside to have uh, some kind of uh, uh, comparative uh, view of the problem. Uh, INL is a thing which I worked on. So the INL is uh, this kind of thin sheet of suspended material. Uh, where there is no, so this is chlorophyll fluorescence, there is no organic activity, it's more the, the dust from the bottom, if you wish, which is rough, rough uh, uh, to, uh, toward, uh, through upwelling, so through a push from the bottom, and which will bring nutrients to the organism. And uh, there is an interest on in looking uh, either inside the INL, or uh, which is not shown here, uh, when we connect with uh, the chlorophyll fluorescent layer to see what is the impact in uh, this aspect. And this problem is, uh, is multidimensional, and I will develop it a little further. It's 
not one single sensor data as opposed to chlorophyll peak. It's a set of sensor data which are collected and how they relate one to another. Um, other problem they are looking at and are looking at right now actually there is a, an experiment at the end of this month which is the front. So the front is a, so this is the temperature of the water in the survey and you see here you have stratified water with very warm on top and very cold at the bottom and then you have uh, the water which is much more uniform along the water column. And at this frontal zone, there is usually a lot of biologic activity, and uh, which is different uh, depending on which side of the front you're looking at. So these are the problems, and they are all very different for, uh, in many aspects, and I will hopefully develop it. There are also new problems which are coming. It's ammonia has a huge role in biology. Big thing is we don't have an existing sensor that can be used on the vehicle right now. So they want to sample in the ammonia, but uh, we don't have things. Uh, but there is all, especially for someone uh, looking at machine learning, is when you're looking at the temperature and salinity, and on many um, measurements, they did physically with them. Uh, from above, you kind of see uh, there is not that much point in having your TV, so uh, you see uh, a cluster over there where the ammonia is uh, higher. So I'm going to go faster. And there is also specific population which are not looking. Okay. So going back to the uh, INL, intermediate nef nef layer. So this is a data that was presented with, to me without a labeling thing. And they were telling me we want to sample this part. But uh, when I was starting to interact with them, it was kind of finer grain than that. It's first off, it's so here's our multiple mission which are uh, put uh, all together. And it's uh, as you can say, so the green part is where they wanted to sample initially. It extends a lot and it overlap with over areas they did define. And it's uh, yeah, at the bottom it's uh, the way I did ask them to, to label the data. And if you're looking here, for example, so there is this thing which is fairly similar, but for them it's not interesting. It has the same chemical property, but the altitude is too close from the bottom, so they didn't care about that. And to do that, I just used a, a simple sum learning at first, where basically I was using some sensor data and a combination of them as an input vector, plus some labeling, which were I was considering as a probability distribution. And as scientists were able to label the full data, because there are a lot of time where they don't fully know, and they don't have also that much time to label this thing, uh, there is a lot of data. It's, I think that I have less than 10% of the data which was labeled. And so it's really, uh, I did something which is kind of semi-supervised learning from SOM, and uh, then from the SOM I extracted cluster. The approach have nothing really formal, it's just me hacking my way through. Um, and, uh, and we did apply it to both INLs uh, in survey, so you see there is a survey here. And also, initially, in another problem, which was trying to look at the nitrate, which is injected from the bay. And for both of them, it worked fairly well. But it was also uh, bringing a lot of problem. Um, so it was a proof of concept. And it was working well enough that scientists were able to do that. But now it's still many challenges. Uh, I, Labeling was really, really difficult. And both because scientists don't have necessarily a full understanding of this problem, and the relevant data we have is often sparse. Yeah, it's a, for example, here it's an analysis of all, genetical analysis of all the sample which were taken in October. 
and we've got our Zara only 10 gold per sample. So from all the points you have, which is 300,000 sensor data for each sensor field, uh, you have only uh, 10, uh, 10 full labels you can fully trust on. And uh, yeah, quickly, so because I'm already over time. Uh, beyond that, so it was just in a single uh, vehicle, but now we are, we are looking at so it's a Zekano initiative, which is, I don't remember, uh, Agile. So it's a it's an ocean network, uh, and the objective is really to have all the assets and the scientists being involved to interact with them. And the goal is really to understand this big cycle. So who is eating who, where is CO2 going, and all these things are evolving. And so it's really trying to put much more the scientists inside the loop of the vehicle, even though they are not there, and really uh, gathering all the data and trying for data from multiple sources, uh, uh, trying to do both historically and in real time uh, this aspect of uh, uh, notifying users when something which is interesting for them, still with this notion of mapping sets of data with a, uh, with a scientific concept, and also allow them to either themselves readapt the mission or even more so being able to anticipate this kind of thing and re target the vehicle dynamically in uh, this example in the bay. And there is this closed full loop, and I will stop there. Thank you very much. As a machine learner, I find it very encouraging when I see people from uh, new fields I haven't um, sort of encountered before uh, sort of try out machine learning. I think that's very encouraging. And I think it's great to, to have uh, oceanographers here and people from other fields here. Um, so any questions for our speaker here? the thing about the ammonia, it's really this aspect, it's right now, so I know that someone at Embury is working on a physical sensor, but it's really, so it's by September, it will be a strong focus on the experiment, and they plan to use AUVs to do that, but right now, there is no real sensor that can provide such data. There is also, so the thing about time series and being able to predict the model, predict a little ahead what's going to happen next, either inside the vehicle 
or not is a is an interesting problem. And then there is really all this data coming from different sources in a more this context, which uh, which is something we are willing uh, we are wanting to exploit. How these data relate one to another, uh, but also and I didn't speak about that, uh, I'm personally interested to explore how I could extract, for example, because we have this system where people can converse around the data and try to really learn what tags are associated for, uh, to this data based on the conversation, for example. Related question for sign uh, uh, You know, if, if you think of uh, active learning, right, what are the data points that can be useful in this context? Is that something that crops up at all? This stuff seems to me there's so much going on. You've yeah. got uh, the deployment, but then you figure out which data is useful to you and not as you learn, right? Yeah. Right, um, right now, yeah, what we did was mostly offline and having something where as the data is coming through, trying to learn, okay, this thing looks uh, something interesting. I don't necessarily know what, or maybe I know, but it's really being about, and it's interesting also because I didn't even speak about this, uh, the communication we have between the vehicle and the shore is very, very sparse. So having the vehicle able to identify what data is important to communicate would be uh, very interesting too. I'm sorry we're running uh, a bit short on time, so uh, thank you very much. Um, let's thank our speaker.